just introduce you, uh, Wilfried Wang. Um, we actually only met a couple of months ago because I felt um, your participation in this conference to be yeah, a huge um, and really nice contribution, uh, being actually a trained architect, but also hoovering in this field of architectural culture, defining architectural culture, first being in London um, and developing the Nine Age Gallery and publications, um, and then later on um, in Berlin, of course, with the uh, Architectural um, Museum over there. Um, now you're teaching in Texas, but you still have your own office uh, together with Barbara Hoyden. Um, yeah, so uh, we would love to hear from you uh, this idea of the practice of architectural research. Um, after your lecture, uh, we invited uh, Sophie de Cailly as part of the dialogue. Uh, she's the director of the Flanders Architectural Institute. So she has a little bit the same role as safeguarding architectural culture in Flanders and um, creating this dialogue. So we thought that would be interesting, but of course, and now I'm talking to all of you, you're already 82 now. Uh, please, after the lecture, feel free to ask your questions uh, or to chat or yeah, just, um, just come along. So Wilfried, I'm gonna give you the floor now. Uh, Thank you. Go to share screen or, or just talk a bit, whatever you like. Well, um, uh, I will share the screen in a moment. Um, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, uh, for inviting me and for um, giving me the opportunity to present uh, the kind of work that uh, I've been doing besides um, being part of an office. So I'm going to share the screen and um, um, present my thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> is this uh, showing up the, the architectural research as a key to understanding buildings? So um, I will focus uh, on the kind of research that I've been doing in architecture, architectural history and uh, architectural theory. Uh, I will not be showing any of my um, office work. If you're interested in that, you can look at hoidenwang.de. Um, the only work that is architectural in a way is uh, the reconstruction of Eileen Gray's E1027 master bedroom, which I'll present in the course of the paper. <clears throat> uh, I teach, as uh, Caroline has mentioned, uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. I've been teaching uh, there uh, since 2000 and uh, before that I was uh, teaching at the GST uh, Harvard University and before that I was uh, in London teaching both at Bartlett and before that at um, North London Polytechnic as it was known where I met uh, Florian Beigel because I was a research fellow at the Agricultural uh, Architectural Geometry Research Unit sorry and um, this is also where I met Phil Christou of course so uh, a lot of uh, connections between various participants here and um, um, my biography. <clears throat> so I'm going to just ask some basic questions. I mean, why understand buildings? I think it's why? because the noise comes out of here rather than there. Can you hear? Oh, hang on. Maybe you can do the sound here. Are you having problems hearing my voice? No? Okay. So why would we want to understand buildings? Why don't we just enjoy them and let them be? Aren't all the buildings uh, the same? All of them stand up. They all provide shelter. They all have facades. They all contain spaces. Uh, each one of them is made of matter. Isn't one building as good as another? Yeah. After all, a building is a building, is a building. <clears throat> Isn't the way that one person understands a building just the same as the way that anyone else understands the same building? Don't we all see the same building in front of us? 
Or isn't the difference in understanding the same building simply a case of personal perception? Isn't my understanding of a building just another opinion and therefore, by definition, subjective? <clears throat> and anyway, why should we want to understand buildings? Why do we need to understand buildings? Why should we want to know whether what the clients or architects claim about their buildings is correct or not? Why should we believe what an architectural critic writes about a building? Why don't we just trust the experts? Isn't their understanding more profound than ours? Isn't their understanding more correct than our understanding? And if we really need to understand buildings, how should we understand them? Well, of course, we need to research, we need to describe, we need to analyze, and we need to evaluate. I'll try to answer some of the questions I raised. We need to understand buildings because they are complex phenomena that don't come about by themselves. We can all sharpen our perceptive tools to begin to understand every building. Not all buildings are the same. Yes, they all consist of matter and they all have an inside and an outside. There are significant differences from one building to another. And these differences can be identified. These differences can be categorized, ordered and structured in terms of purpose, meaning, and embodied cultural ambition. So distinct from the spoken or written words, and unlike drawings or photographs, buildings are incontrovertible evidence. They are facts. Therefore, regardless what critics politicians, clients, architects, and others might claim about buildings, their real presence is in a specific physical and cultural context, can be analyzed and evaluated independently from such statements. <clears throat> so conscientious architectural research is publicly transparent, scientifically analytical, and independently verifiable. Is forensic in the original Latin origin of the word pertaining to a forum. However, rather than investigating buildings in the pathological or criminal dimensions, some buildings indeed possess these, for example, mass housing schemes in conjunction with the occupational regimes. The goal of any research into buildings is to identify their cultural ambitions and their contribution to the architectural discourse, their architectural achievements. Research should uncover a building's character of reality. By that, I mean the identification of the embodied intentions. This is a concept that was developed by the Austrian art historian Dagobert Frey. And uh, there are also other terms that one can use, such as a worldview. Dagobert Frey means that you are able to identify the embodied intentions. How would the world look like? How would it be constituted and represented if only all buildings were made the same way? At a basic quotidian level, we need to understand buildings because we need to ensure that buildings reach a minimum quality. For that, most societies have planning regulations and building codes. At the most ambitious level, we should expect that buildings constitute and represent 
our social and cultural aspirations. We should strive for buildings to be appropriate for their tasks, that they accommodate normal needs, while others should do, while others should arise above this to celebrate communal values. Some buildings need only be comfortably modest, others should inspire. The reality is that few people are concerned with questions of architectural quality. Neither politicians nor clients, not even the majority of so-called architects are interested in this. If they were, there would be better buildings in the world. So why do we want to understand buildings? We want to understand buildings because we need to design and build better buildings. We need to differentiate, we need a differentiated understanding of buildings because we need to know when and where to apply our knowledge. As diverse as society is, as varied as our needs are, and as specialized as the activities in our settlements are, we need to design buildings appropriately in response to each of these conditions. That means not every building needs to be an icon. We want to learn from buildings so that we can instill in those interested in designing and building an awareness of what is appropriate to give them a sense of quality, as well as an idea of the scope of what was achieved in the past and what might be possible in the future. <clears throat> what do students of architecture normally learn in their history classes? Conventionally, they're told the stories of the pyramids, temples, cathedrals, and villas by dead white males. It is the canonical history of newly built freestanding objects. It is not surprising then to see that these canonical values have been dutifully regurgitated by architects once they got a chance to practice. The intellectual level in the conventional teaching of architectural history and theory is deliberately set low so that failure in these courses is not an option. On the other hand, there are few schools of architecture in the English language world that teach classes in architectural composition. Not that this is a guarantee of intellectual or design quality. So while there probably is a broad consensus for the need to understand buildings, how they work, that is to say, in all dimensions of the meaning of the word work, there are very few, there are very few courses that address how we learn about how buildings work. This was my understanding when I studied architecture in the late 1970s, and unfortunately, I cannot say that this situation has changed over the last half a century. There have been few cases when uh, buildings have been presented in a way that has made them come to another life other than their mere representation in photographs, printed words, spoken words, or videos. Some 40 years ago, I attended Neil Levine's brilliant lecture on Henri Labrousse's Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve at the AA Symposium on Neoclassicism. It gave me and others in the audience an idea of what comprehensive research could mean. Hermann Czech, uh, with his meticulous analysis of Adolf Lohs, Goldman and Zalach, uh, Taylor's art treatise, a book that he published in 1976, provided another such experience. So, a three-year fellowship at the uh, North London Polytechnic, now known as the London Metropolitan University, at Florian Beigel's Architecture Geometry Research Unit, gave me the chance to delve into architecture. My ostensible research topic was to study ways by which the design of primary healthcare facilities in any global context might be better prepared 
by understanding the spe spatial traditions of the given contexts. For this, I developed a descriptive method for the analysis of building elements. This became part of an analytical method that I subsequently integrated into a theory of architecture. The focus of this theoretical approach is to describe and value the connections between the physical manifestation of a built edifice on the one hand, and its social cultural significance, as well as its spatial and formal qualities on the other. So basically speaking, theory is about description, analysis and evaluation. Practice is about choosing elements, composing them synthetically and in order to communicate meaning. Uh, the first is uh, the set of uh, vocabulary, second is syntax and third is semantics. And then theory and practice are two sides of the same middle. Um, and description focuses on things like the relationships of objects, such as the name, the concept, and the geometric definition. For example, when is a square planned element of different heights a post, a pillar, or a block? When its proportion is rather short, it's a block. When it is longer, it is a pillar. And when it gets really thin, it's a post. When is a wall a wall? Uh, or when is it a pillar, a pier, and so on? So we have in every language in the world names, concepts, and morphological uh, definitions. So this is where I started. And um, I proposed that there are five morphological categories, construction, tectonic, compartment, configuration, context. And that in each one of these morphological categories, there are elements that can be described according to their proportions. So that in a nutshell, uh, was the work of three years of uh, developing a description, a descriptive method, and later um, developed into um, a very straightforward theory of architecture. That has helped me to structure my thoughts and my way of seeing architecture. Now I'm going to explain how in the course of the last 40 years, I've focused on certain things, on certain topics, and how I have um, you know, uh, received a kind of a, a, a view of architecture that way. The first uh, architect uh, that I focused on was Mies van der Rohe. And I essentially as a student read a book by uh, Wolfgang, Wolfram Höpfner and Fritz Neumeyer Fritz Neumeyer, the more well-known Mies scholar, uh, their book on Peter Behrens' Wiegand House. Wiegand House is a villa here in Berlin. This is the garden view, a Wilhelminian uh, piece of architecture. Um, this is the plan, uh, which you just saw the garden view, and there is this tennis pavilion with a pergola. And it's situated on a corner site with this a U shaped plan, um, an entrance const uh, construct, and then a service wing, which happens to be a square overlapping with this U shaped plan. This is all described by uh, Fritz Neumeyer and uh, um, Wolfgang Höpfner. Uh, and they also talk about uh, the influence that uh, Friedrich Wilhelm uh, IV sketch for Charlottenhof had on this villa. You see this Palladian uh, main building with a pergola and um, exedra at the end. So it's a similar 
typology. Mies was, uh, an, the, uh, was an architect in the office of Peter Behrens in 1910, 1911, and uh, 1911, he designs um, this house, which has essentially the same typology, the Werner house. And interestingly, this is a kitchen courtyard with a, an extended wall. This um, is an addition that was uh, constructed uh, later. That's the original uh, building. The house Esther's that you know the plan of also has this interesting courtyard. This is 1926 to 28. And then of course, uh, the Barcelona Pavilion, which has uh, a tripartite house, if you like, and a square served, a uh, servant part, All right? So this being the servant quarters with the chauffeur and the garage, this being the uh, servant part in the square, back to this service part here in the Vigant house. So this, this typological continu uh, continuity uh, is quite interesting, it's quite fascinating and uh, explains Mises' interest in um, something that you can find throughout his houses. But it doesn't stop here, it continues with the new National Gallery and you probably are familiar with a plan. This is the lower ground, uh, lower ground floor plan. And what you see is a um, rectangle where the uh, axis of symmetry is played in relation to the upper level and the service part, the director's office, the restoration space of the library and the delivery is repressed in the composition, which is quite clever, right? This is the, uh, the main canopy. This is the axis of symmetry. This is what you uh, uh, stand on when you first approach. And as you go down, you're not aware of all of this stuff, right? So simple over, uh, overlapping of plans. I found that fascinating in 1979, 1980. And it was published in 9H number two. Uh, this is uh, the cover that I drew uh, for 9H number two. In fact, five years later, um, Yehuda Zafran and I uh, organized uh, an exhibition on out of laws uh, for the Arts Council of Great Britain and I was uh, shown in London and it went on uh, uh, European tour. Um, Alva Alto uh, raised for me a number of curious questions and um, I, I read Dimitri Porfirio's um, PhD which was later published as the uh, sources of eclecticism and I was sort of curious why uh, that was the title. Um, and I'll come back to Porfirio's in a moment, but um, what fascinated me with uh, Alto and the Villa Maria was um, how, how did he come about with this uh, designs layout? This is the view from the artist studio at the top of the building. And what we see is a swimming pool, a sauna, a covered external dining space, the roof, something quite typical in Scandinavian countries, a berm, and there's a, a wooden gate, and there's another uh, berm there. So earth, water, fire, fire. Um, there were various uh, versions of this design. And this one is quite telling because it shows the contours of the site and it shows how uh, this is a three-sided uh, building, a U-shaped uh, courtyard building, but the fourth side is made up of the berm that is 
also artificial, but what Alto intends is that this is the origin, right? This is where everything starts. So there is a rotational movement that is terminated in the artist's studio, right? This is the artist's studio. And of course, you know, uh, I'm putting this in a nutshell. I'm suggesting that the Villa Maria is uh, an exploration in the uh, synthesizing the, of the development of civilization from primary elements into artistic expression. Now, that, that is not a, a singular event, uh, can be seen in the cultural center in Wolfsburg. I was always curious why uh, there were these um, regulating lines. You could say, well, you know, you need those to set out these uh, lecture theaters. You know, functionalist argument. And um, I had the occasion to study this building and uh, also to the, co the competition drawings. If you were a normal person, a kid, you would have stories told in the external reading space or uh, the children's library section here. This is the main library. Um, if you were a um, young kid or young adult, Alta provided or the program provided a milk bar in this area. And the milk bar was connected to the upper floor by the staircase, a youth center where you um, would do arts and crafts. And uh, there were shops here facing the streets. And this is the uh, reception area, the coat hanging area for the adult education center that's above, right? And then you have the library uh, below. So this is the uh, upper floor. And what we see is the staircase coming up to the youth center here and the adult education uh, center with uh, the different sized auditoria. And at the end of this sequence is the artist atelier. So if you were a young Wolfsburg person and you were told little stories as a child and you would visit these things regularly and then you grew up and you would work uh, in these different workshops and then as an adult you would use these and maybe you would graduate to become an, uh, an artist as the highest form of civilization. That is what uh, Alto um, implied. He never wrote about it, but he implied it. He said that it's, uh, the cultural center is very important as an antidote to the, to the technology that is um, the mainstay of the VW production. And just to underline that, I, I find it's not just a coincidence that this is a kind of um, golden section, a volute, a, an ionic gesture, as this is too. This is my assertion. Right, so you can keep this in mind. Uh, in any case, I found this fascinating and uh, I find it quite convincing. Um, coming back to Porfirios, Porfirios says that this plan is a kind of a hodgepodge. It's a kind of com completely out of control, out of control, cramming of things uh, that otherwise, you know, they have no uh, locus, they have no a center of uh, organization. And I would suggest that he hasn't understood the building. Uh, Sigurd Leverens, um, well, Patrick uh, Lynch has already talked uh, about this building. For me, it was a very important experience. Oh, it's now an auto. Uh, Uh, I don't know whether I can stop it. Anyway, um, 
The important thing here is the mapping of uh, five very significant moments in the life of a person from uh, marriage to bapt uh, baptism to um, communion to children's daycare to um, catechism. And that's all organized on this diagonal. And seemingly like a perfunctory uh, plan where you have a square nave and you have this L-shaped um, uh, additional building for parish and parish hall, uh, which, you know, uh, sort of bureaucratically minded uh, church commissioners might have said, oh yeah, that looks very, that looks very functional. That's all very orthogonal, you know, tick. Let him do that, right? And in fact, it has a, an underlying meaning. It is facing the north wind, uh, the northwest wind, uh, sorry, the north um, east wind. And so there is, um, there is a particular uh, role that this gesture plays in the overall um, composition. Um, Tessinor, not a very uh, liked architect. Um, this uh, temple fronted building probably turns most students off. It's a kind of conventional institutional building. This is for the uh, Institute of Rhythmic Gymnastic, Emile Jacques Dalcroze in Hellerau, which is uh, uh, a small a town outside Dresden in Saxony, in, in the eastern part of Germany. And this was completed in 1911. The interesting thing was um, the interior. I don't know how many of you have uh, noticed or studied the interior. This is um, the view of the auditorium and the stage. Stage was, uh, in this case, designed by Adolf Appia. And the textile cladding, both of the ceiling and of the walls, was designed by a Russian artist called Alexander von Salzmann. Absolutely extraordinary. 1911. Mies van der Rohe's girlfriend was a um, student in um, the Rhythmic Institute, and he came in 1911. I think he was pr probably pretty much impressed, both by uh, the textile ethereal quality of the space. And this is the technology that's behind the, uh, the textile. 5,000 differently colored lamps that were controlled by rheostats to provide different ambience. Amazing concept, right? Even for 1911. Uh, here's another detail of, uh, this is uh, for Gluck's office in, uh, office in Juridice uh, and uh, descent into Hades. Appia, whose earlier designs were all naturalistic, um, in 1910, 1911, changed to um, uh, monolithic or let's say kind of a masonry uh, abstracted la um, landscape. And I would suggest that uh, Mies was heavily influenced by this later that you see in the we Weissenhof Siedlung. But 1911, uh, Tessinor was concerned with the ideal of norm, of the everyday house for everyday normal people. Here's a row house, here's a freestanding house. And of course, you know, the idea of exploring what is norm, what should be a standard, is alien to architects, not to Tessinor. Tessinor was interested in what is the norm, what can the norm be? And this is a, a norm of, you know, uh, of, uh, of a certain kind of domesticity. Sharon was another person I uh, have been very much interested in um, for his, principally for his architectural ideas, less so for his uh, urban uh, ideas, which I think are, are less successful. And the key building, of course, is the Philharmonie, which is 
the antidote to uh, Albert Speer's megalomaniac um, designs for Berlin. Here, the hall for uh, uh, of 300 meters height for 200,000 people. This is the Brandenburg Gate here. This is uh, the Reichstag. Uh, and uh, this was to be at the fulcrum of a very long 42 kilometer axis that um, was going to go through the new capital of the world. Um, this is the view of the interior collage. I think, uh, I, th I think this is quite funny. Uh, if you squint, then you see here a cartoon of Hitler with his hair, his eyes, and his uh, mustache. But um, Sharon's uh, proposal for a tent-like structure as a gathering space where the audience is differentiated and not treated like a mass differentiate in such a way that the average number on uh, sitting in these different inclined uh, surfaces is approximately the size of an average orchestra, I think is an important um, innovation in a way that uh, auditorium is subdivided. And there are a number of other issues which I don't have time to go into, but this is one of them, the key issues, as is the, the rather straightforward construction technology that was used. It's, it still uh, amazes people like Geary and others, um, and it should do because it's such an intelligent and straightforward uh, construction. And it's simply a, a, an amazing space. Um, and I put a book together on this, uh, seven years ago. Now to Eileen Gray. Rosamond Diamond, um, working with us on 9H, uh, proposed that we should look at Eileen Gray's work in the early 1980s. She just passed away on um, 1976 and we uh, put together an issue of 9H where we had a number of essays and uh, uh, permission to reproduce some of the drawings from the VNA. And I've always wondered, you know, why this building was, um, you know, I, I had questions about the building. I didn't really know why. I looked at the plan, I looked at the photographs and, um, this is, these are her photographs of the interior uh, of this vacation house. She designed everything. She designed the landscape, the building, the subdivisions, the fitted furniture, the loose furniture, the carpets, the lights. Um, yeah. The color scheme, of course. And uh, so, I made it a, a, a focus of some research with students at um, UT Austin. Uh, and I'm just showing one example of the kind of research um, that a couple of students undertook. Folding screen. Uh, it's this folding screen here, this object here, right? And in the National Museum of Ireland, there is a model from um, a collection that uh, Peter Adam, uh, the biographer of um, Eileen Gray had in his possession, which he sold to the National Museum of Ireland. And uh, it's displayed like this. And uh, we drew that and we thought, well, maybe this is the, the object that is actually the screen in the living room. And we realize uh, the object is upside down. It's displayed upside down in the National Museum of Ireland. They don't, I mean, they don't know any better, but uh, in looking at the uh, drawings, uh, we deduced that that was the case. So 
it's this object here and it's inserted and then um, we, we were thinking about how it would operate, what kind of um, guide, uh, guide rails there would be, etc. And so um, the students did these um, 3D animations and they made details and then we played around with Photoshop, right? So this is the uh, version of uh, four years ago or five years ago and um, we just, you know, inserted this thing and obliterated uh, Le, Cor Le Corbusier's, uh, one of his more obnoxious um, um, murals. Um, for the monograph that I plan to do, I undertook a number of um, proportional studies. And it was uh, in the archive at the VNA that you could see these drawings I mean, Eileen Gray destroyed a number of her drawings, but not everything. And it's interesting that these things have survived. Maybe she allowed these things to survive intentionally. Who knows? These are some proportional studies taken from textbooks. Here's a drawing of uh, a golden section. Uh, here's another one. Here's an ionic volute, an ionic spiral, which for some interesting reason, you see in the turret uh, at the top of the floor, and you see it in this drawing. So I thought it's probably likely that something is in this. And this is her drawing of the golden spiral or the golden rectangle. So um, anyway, to cut a long story short, um, just one example of uh, a kind of a proportional um, compositional approach. Every bed in this house has a bedside table. It's either fixed or it's um, movable, but it's attached to the wall. In the, in the lower bedroom, there is a little reading box, which is here. Right, and it's positioned in such a way that it's in golden section. This is the bed, right? That's the wall, that's the other wall. In the main living room, there is a two tier bedside table. The structure is on golden section between the partition and that partition. Now you could say it's fluke, right? Beginner's luck. In the main master bedroom, the bedside table is in golden section to that wall. Um, that's of course golden section. The guest niche has a uh, rotating reading table and that's also positioned in golden section to that space. In fact, the little toilet, the guest toilet is in golden section. Right, so I, I then tried another model, which is this double square uh, rotating uh, diagram. And it approximates to the plan. And it's focused around the central entrance lobby, which is a square space. Right. So anyway, full of it. You can even do it in the elevations. Um, so there are other qualities in this building. Uh, and I'm going to mention one. Uh, in the guest niche, there is uh, the fireplace here and the wall and there's uh, the wall uh, projecting out and there's a window with a shutter or two shutters and the lower shutter has an aperture. And this aperture, if you're lying in the bed, gives you a view of the coast in the distance. So this is a phenomenon of extending the, the sense of space while you're protected in this niche, 
you have this extinction out into uh, the landscape. And that's one technique of using the idea of economy of space uh, as a kind of variation of what Adolf Roos is doing with his grand plan. So, um, having researched every single piece in the master bedroom and reconstructed everything in drawings, we reconstructed the pieces. We reconstructed the coiffeuse, this um, document uh, cupboard, the, this whole thing, the um, chest of drawers. Um, we con reconstructed this uh, folding, this folding bedside table here. Um, anyway, um, we reconstructed this table and the chest of uh, uh, documents. Uh, this. Uh, ceiling light. I found on French eBay a hand wash basin with the, exactly the same um, taps. We reconstructed this circular um, tray. So this was shown uh, in three uh, locations in Austin, in Berlin, and in Porto, and it might be shown in uh, San Sebastian in the summer next year. One, one <laughs> tricky question was, how the hell does this table work? Well, it took us three years to offer one option. I'm not saying it's the real solution, but it works. It does exactly what the, uh, the image uh, suggests. Yeah, and this is um, how the bedside and folding uh, table works. This rotates and it can fold down. So uh, these are the many students who worked on it. It was a big team effort and it uh, then resulted in this monograph. So I'm coming to the last uh, three uh, groups of architects that I've been studying and that I've been fascinated with. And Alvaro Cesar was an early one. I, I met him in 1980, 81, and um, at the Boa Nova Tea House uh, had this uh, Adolf Appia sensation when climbing up these uh, staircases and um, seeing the edge of the um, uh, landing meet the horizon was uh, an absolutely amazing sensation. And uh, of course, we've been following him uh, in Berlin with the Monjou Tristesse and the interior reorganization of the courtyard uh, where uh, it's, I think this is a very important piece of rejuvenation, urban rejuvenation, where access to the rear courtyards has been made possible. It's a very laconic um, piece of landscape architecture, but it works extremely well. And I think contrary to some of uh, his colleagues uh, of the similar age, I think uh, Caesar is still producing amazing work. This is um, the church Saint-Jacques de la Lande in Rennes, in France. And to my mind, it's uh, a building that is like um, squaring the circle. So there is this implied uh, drum and above that uh, is this lowered canopy uh, and you have this idea of the space extending uh, around you. And of course the detailing is immaculate and designed to last, contrary to some architects who are more interested in gestures. Of course, Caesar is aware of uh, the history of architecture, right? So this notion of a lowered canopy, 
nothing new. Um, all the extension uh, rising up, nothing new. Or the conversation with, uh, uh, you know, other, other architects in the room. Or even a reference to his own architecture. This is the Beira House uh, uh, of um, at the, around the time 1974 when his wife died, and it was called the Bomb House. It was like uh, all. It was an expression of frustration. And so, in a way, the Church uh, Saint Jacques de la Lande is returning to this configuration and is making peace. Um, Alborda is a team, um, very interesting group of architects who are departing from uh, the, certainly from the star system and from the well-trodden parts of uh, professional architects. Um, they designed a school for fishing a community on the coast of Ecuador. Uh, they were called one day by this uh, community saying, you know, they need a school. Uh, and they, they were delighted. They said, yeah, sure, we'll design your school. And then they asked, well, what's your budget? And they said, we have $50. $50. And they said, okay, $50 it is. Uh, and together with local, the locals, the community, and with materials found nearby, they built the structure. And they have since undertaken bottom-up architecture, which I find remarkable and um, is one way of revalidating uh, the importance of architecture. And finally, um, in the many, many architects that I've looked at and that I've taken an interest in, uh, this is uh, a young couple from Mallorca, Irene um, Perez and Jean Mayol, for example, here a, a remodeling of a, an apartment building uh, for holiday um, for uh, holiday apartments using local materials uh, in an innovative way and giving the building a flair of Mallorca without resorting to any of the kitsch. Um, and this, I think, is uh, a remarkable project, which is an inscription in a 1960s apartment building. These are the existing conditions. It's the corner uh, apartment with these pillars strewn around and they've inserted three boxes um, which provide uh, bedrooms and uh, a kitchen and there are different articulations of that and uh, they create in intermediate spaces um, and what is important about this project is the um, the removal of uh, material as a kind of a starting point and allowing the building to remain in its uh, original 1960s raw construction. Uh, partitions were taken out and uh, uh, those gaps were filled with marble. Um, the walls were uh, insulated with cork and then with these uh, tiles. Um, and that's it. So let me conclude. From the analysis of these buildings and taking an interest in other issues and as a practicing architect, um, of course, uh, I've looked at other theoretical issues uh, such as the sublime and the picturesque, uh, minimal and minimalist architecture, modern and modernist architecture. Um, and some time ago, I um, suggested that sustainability is not a technological problem, but it's a cultural problem. Uh, we cannot and will not solve this issue of climate change um, through technology. 
This was published in 2003 in Harvard Design Mus uh, Magazine. And uh, recently I've um, published an essay in um, Festschrift uh, in honor of Kenneth Frampton with the title uh, Site Specificity, Skilled Labor and Culture, Architectural Principles in the Age of Climate Change. Uh, it is a summary reckoning with the failures of technocratic modernism and a plea for an architecture in the coming age of climate change that acknowledges the unique qualities of place, the creative role of skilled labor, and the need for the presencing of physically constructed culture, as opposed to the placeless virtuality uh, in order to ensure a matrix for our existence. Thank you very much. I'm going to unmute, start my video, and please could everybody show their face and just, you know, I really like what David did is just unmute everybody and give a warm thank you uh, to Wilfried Frank for his wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Oh, your lecture raised lots of questions. Um, Sophie, I'll give you the word first, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And first of all, thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring lecture. Um, I would like to ask several questions, um, focusing mainly on uh, three issues, um, on methods, also on the concept of time, and uh, also on the canon. And I, I would like to zoom out a bit uh, from, this, uh, from the examples uh, you talked about, going into the core of the questions uh, of this conference. Um, because I'm really curious uh, to know your thoughts. So today there were already several discussions and presentations that focus on the methodologies and the tools that are at the disposal of the practicing architect as a researcher and studying space by using many methodologies like drawing, redrawing space, studying and redrawing uh, sketches and plans and making and remaking spatial interventions when we just saw a very beautiful example of um, Eileen Gray's house. And you showed us in a very convincing way that these methods, um, they add to the uh, theoretical knowledge and they add to the understanding of architecture by which you started your lecture. lecture. And uh, in this question, I would like to, um, to bring it back to the practice itself. How does this influence also the design practice of the architects as space makers? Um, so this is my first question, and I'm really curious because I know um, you both you have uh, both uh, profiles and how you intertwine those. Um, and the second uh, question um, is so much related uh, to this first one. I would uh, love to um, to pose it immediately. Um, could it then be that um, the concept of time also changes when taking the perspective of the practicing architect? Because since modernity, there is this linear uh, concept of uh, time in architectural history and theory. And what changes if one adopts a different attitude that is fed by the analysis of the built environment when making spaces? Could it be that practicing architects tend to see time not as linear while it is still an underlying idea in uh, architectural theory? And I loved um, uh, what you said about CISA that uh, there is a conversation with other architecture in the room. Um, and it also reminded me of uh, the beginning of today um, where Helen Thompson um, launched a concept or, or spoke about, uh, she introduced um, the idea of history as a big mind that needs to be excavated and that can enrich uh, the practice. Um, this is of course a metaphor and there is no uh, linearity. So how would you see uh, the concept of time in this? Well, um, uh, I don't believe that there is such a thing as discontinuity. Uh, I think we live in a continuity. And um, <laughs> for example, we are involved in uh, conservation projects, 1950s buildings or 1890s buildings and so on. 
And it is our view that it is not contrary to the Charter of Venice, it is not the right approach to lay over uh, our secretion um, on an existing building. On the contrary, I think it's important to allow the building to have its original character as much as possible. And that is often not made, not allowed by conservationists. The official conservationists usually say, no, you, you have to make a difference. In the, in the nine, 1955 building by Paul Baumgarten, a concert hall, we insisted that we wanted to uh, allow it to stay as closely as possible to its original 1950s uh, detail. And uh, we succeeded in convincing people. Um, but you know that that varies. If it's a nineteen, if it's an eighteen nineties building, uh, conservationist attitude could change. If it, if it's a, if it's a case of a modernist conservationist, they might insist on the uh, the difference approach. But in my view, we uh, serve these buildings better if they are maintained as closely as possible uh, in the original version. That means that you have to study it, and it's not so obvious. In the 1950s uh, concert hall, we had to go through uh, the, uh, the archive and we had to review which details were used, which materials were used, some of which are no longer available. So then you have to invent a contemporary system to, re, uh, to recreate the surface. That's an, at least our approach. So now to answer uh, this, this issue of how does research, how does one's research influence practice and, uh, and what is the role of time? You know, we are surrounded by um, objects of different ages. And the question of uh, the, the modernist ideal, the simplified modernist ideal I'm characterizing is to make everything modern, right? To knock down all the decorations, to make everything homogeneous. That's a kind of naive, caricature, I know. But in a way, that's also, um, uh, to some extent, the way that uh, students are being educated. You know, that history is past. History is history is like, you know, not interesting. It's boring. We are here to create the new style and the new, you know, the uh, assertion of uh, the future. That's still very much the inculcation among students. And so for uh, architectural students and some modernists, there is this idea that, you know, anything that was constructed before the modern period is, can be thrown away. So yes, of course, history uh, is a resource. If we understand, um, and this is Helen, uh, Helen's point, if we understand things, um, well, then we can, then our palette of options is that much bigger. And if we understand the profundity of uh, some of the architecture that's gone before us, uh, we come a little bit more respectful of the idea of inventing or of, you know, of wanting to make a certain kind of statement. Because in, in previous objects, as uh, I've, I've outlined a little bit, uh, there are profound thoughts and profound statements, uh, which, you know, are, are difficult to match, frankly. Thank you very much. Can I elaborate on that, Arsophy? You have your second yes. question? No, no, go ahead. Well, yeah, it's about um, suddenly your um, approach towards the modern. I mean, um, a lot of the faces that I see here in the little squares in front of me, they're uh, part of our faculty here, since, um, which is KU Leuven, based in St. Lucas. And we're really dealing with tradition here, I think, in many ways, in very inventive ways. And um, <laughs> somebody said here, maybe um, you're teaching too much in Texas then, because here, I think, we're really trying to engage with, um, with history. And the word modern is so double in every sense and misused that we, we try to avoid it a little bit here. Um, there's another approach that you said, which, which really um, uh, inspires me much more. And that's when you talk about the work of Leverens, you uh, wrote about this reflective ontology. 
So we're talking about discursive practice, reflective practice here all the time, and you are bending it towards this reflective ontology. And you know, in one of your other writings, you write, there's a need for the re-evaluation of the relation and meaning between idea and form. Logical roots. So for me, when you talk about history and when you talk about the past, you talk about roots. Are we allowed to do that? I hope. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, of course we are. And we always have to. Um, uh, there is such a thing as, uh, you know, what um, uh, Max Weber called the ideal type, and that as a notion exists in every field of uh, thought. Uh, that is, that there is some kind of ideal uh, which we would like to, uh, we, which we hope that it exists, but we know that it doesn't. Uh, for example, uh, the discussion about ornament, you know, there, there are people who think that it's possible to design an ornamentless building. Well, it's not, right, because everything has a certain uh, articulation, it has a certain uh, symbolic dimension, it has a certain um, um, role that it plays beyond the functional, beyond the kind of irreducible. And so, you know, if, if, if you want to send around the form police or the ornament police, you would probably uh, charge a lot of uh, fines if, if that were the, the treatment of, of buildings that have ornament. Um, and the same applies to, you know, history. I think we, of course, there's a continuity in the way that things are constructed. Uh, there are ideas, both uh, humdrum ideas, technological ideas, but there are also formal ideas that are uh, carried forward. And even in modernist architecture, right? So we know that. Uh, and therefore, I think it's, um, it's, um, what's the word? It's useless to um, play up one against the other. That's to say, it's useless to say, oh, because we are in a historical context, we deserve to be more modern, or because we are in a more modernist context, we deserve to be more historical. Um, in, in Germany, we do have the situation that um, there have been so many phases of destruction, you know, Second World War brought upon the Germans themselves, um, that there's a reconstructionitis, right? They, they want to reconstruct this and this and this, and the reconstructions are just monsters simply monsters because they're on the outside they have some form of you know craftsmanship and so on they look like um, the things that used to be but on the inside of course it's reinforced concrete with a plasterboard and uh, down lighters you know it's completely unthinkable to most sensitive individuals who think that they're architects in germany not a problem right so the, the impossibility of understanding the, the weight of history, including political errors, that, that is Nazism, right? That is the destruction out of the Second World War. That is uh, the loss of identity as a result of that. Should challenge people to actually think more profoundly about what new architecture should mean and to what extent it engages with history and with the place, right? And, but if you, if you buy wholesale into technocratic modernism, you just compound the loss. And that's the situation that we have in Germany, right? So um, yes, uh, Texas, uh, there is a little bit of historic substance, not a lot, uh, a lot of it has been swept away. And they're oblivious to that. Uh, but there is a sizable domestic scene, you know, villas and so on, uh, which still has a lot of admirers. And so there are some people who are trying to preserve that domestic uh, architecture. But the rest, the public architecture, is largely modern, it's largely 20th century. Um, that is true for Texas, but it's not true for uh, East Coast. The East Coast is still incredibly uh, homogeneous in the inner city parts. 
And so actually New York City, uh, Boston, Philadelphia have more historic substance than some German cities have, right? If you tell that a German, they get very flustered. They, oh, well, the Americans, blah, 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 right? But it's true. So um, yes, of course, context in your case plays a role how people are um, intending or uh, kind of in their frame of mind more interested in counteracting but my my uh, argument is don't try to build on the historic substance don't try to secrete your layer of uh, ego because it's more important to make a a contribution to the whole and for the whole to have a uniform character it will have different expressions anyway because you know we have changes in use given those pressures it is more important to try and keep a cohesive as cohesive a culture as possible because there are plenty of other pressures uh caroline can i ask a question please do well it's it's a very detailed question first of all i just want to uh uh thank uh Professor Wang uh, for his uh, lecture because it was it was absolutely fascinating and uh, and uh, I was um, uh, how to say I was uh, I was uh, hooked on it from the beginning to the end it was really very interesting uh, thank so you. thank you for that um, I have a very specific question because uh, this morning I missed the first part of the conference because I was teaching a, a, a course on composition and uh, my students were analyzing the uh, Barcelona pavilion um, and uh, what I love about that exercise is that uh, every time they do it uh, every student has a different analysis of the pavilion it's uh, it's it's infinitely analyzable and infinitely uh, um, uh, protean in its uh, possibilities of understanding the composition. But one of the things that comes up all the time is the golden section. And so I was very uh, 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 intrigued by uh, what you found in the E1027, uh, because you found all these golden sections there. But what I, what I often tell them in this class is that uh, if you're actually going to build something, uh, it doesn't so often happen uh, that it's the golden section, but it's maybe Fibonacci numbers, because you have to come down to uh, uh, you know whole number dimensions and that kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that, but uh, do you think it it would be uh, uh, would it be equivalent to say that those are uh, rather uh, Fibonacci numbers than the golden section in itself, because the, of course we know the, the golden number is uh, irrational, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Very um, yes. Uh, no, I, I mean, I've, I've had my go at this uh, as well, and I have not been able to find either a Fibonacci or a golden section diagram. So that's, that's my, my result. Anyway, I've, I've tried it. But that doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily one behind it. The other um, uh, fact is the Wiegand House. If you look at the Wiegand House, as Fritz Neumeyer and uh, Wolfram Höpfner show, uh, Behrens used the golden section on that, right? And it's riddled with it. Even the, the stone panels are in golden section. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty well documented. And so if you know, Mies, who was in the office at the time that the building was built, uh, he was aware of that then. He was aware of it later. And, he, you know, as I suggest that he used the typology, carried that forward in, a, uh, in an abstracted sense. Um, I think it's probably likely that there are more or less Fibonacci sequences in the Barcelona Pavilion. And that uh, for various reasons, don't know why uh, they're not perfect. 
but there are you know 21 to 14 instead of 21 to 13 and so on you know those, those kinds of uh, tiles if you count the tiles you could do that but i think the most, yeah and the most important thing is in my view is the fact that you've got a service square which is marked by the uh, little little um information uh, room at the back the long wall and the uh, the pool uh, relating to the tripartite uh, house that has this rectangular roof so to me that's a basic um, typological statement and that's enough for me but um, what about what about, uh, what about e1027 e1027 you have to imagine this is one person who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, forty-eight or something like that. Or yeah, she was forty-eight, um, building her first house. This is her first house, and she designed everything, the landscape down to the light fitting, and she applied this golden section to everything because she was a novice and she thought, well, you know, let's try it. And, and the fascinating thing is, to my knowledge, nobody's written about it. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's there in the archives. There are all the drawings in the archives, right? Nobody looked at them. Okay, for some people, golden section is old hat. It's like, you know, 19th, 17th, 18th, you know, Masonic uh, rituals and so on, uh, Egyptians and all that stuff. Well, Here's a person who is a novice designing a masterpiece, simply as that. It's, it's the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art designed by one person of the early 20th century. You know, nobody, Le Corbusier hasn't designed a house with everything in it. Um, um, the, the Schroeder house is the joint uh, design by uh, occupant and architect, right? So, um, and you know the fate of this uh, this house, right? Um, Eileen Gray gave it to Badovici. Um, Badovici lived in it. Then the Second World War came. Um, Le Corbusier claimed uh, it as his. Do you know the story? I mean, you know the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he even even undressed himself in order to claim it. Well, not only that, I mean, uh, I mean, when Badovici died, uh, he didn't have an heir, and it was sold at auction. And uh, Le Corbusier organized. Um, he he wrote around uh, his circle of friends, saying, "Is anybody there who wants to buy this house?" And he found um, Madame Chelbert, in Zurich, a gallerist, and he told her to bring cash to the uh, auction. And it was never called at auction because Le Corbusier spoke with the auctioneer saying, here's a cash, don't call it, you know, we'll buy it straight. Uh, Madame Chalbert lived in this house uh, until uh, she died, essentially. Uh, one day, um, Jean-Paul Rayon, a French architect, knocks at the door and says, I would like to, you know, hello, Madame Chalbert, I would like to do a measured drawing of this building because it's a very important modern house. Mm. And she said, yes. And he said, it's by Eileen Gray and Jean Badovici. And she says, no, it's by Le Corbusier. No. So Le, Cor Le Corbusier never told her that it wasn't his house. <laughs> and moreover, he made her pay for the murals extra. Unbelievable. So, you know, and then there's another sequence, there's another story which is in the archives at the uh, Confirmation Le Corbusier. Um, Badovici um, was asked by Le Corbusier to take photographs of the murals. It took him ages. And when he sent them, Le Corbusier wrote back, these are really awful black and white photographs. I could have taken better ones myself. You're an, you know, you're an asshole. And um, Badovici wrote back saying, you know, very disappointed to have your letter. Uh, we thought, I thought we were friends and you know, you're treating me so badly. And I have in mind I have in mind reinstating the building to its original version. 
and Le Corbusier's alarm bells go and he writes back immediately, if you do that, I will announce this to the world and your reputation will be in ruins. Nice friends to have, right? That sounds very much like Le Corbusier. I would yeah, just, so, uh, you know. to, 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 just to, to, um, to finish because I don't want to monopolize, monopolize the conversation, but uh, there's just a, a small parallel because you're speaking of somebody who's 48 years old and who's uh, realizing her first uh, building. Uh, it makes me think a little bit of uh, Thomas Jefferson with the University of Virginia, which I'm sure you know. Uh, also a, a kind of naive uh, first uh, oeuvre, uh, which is at the same time very sophisticated and which also um, at least according to my analysis, uh, is also using things like the golden proportion and stuff like that. So it's it's just, uh, it, you know, she wasn't the first uh, um, oh, naive architect to uh, autodidact uh, to use uh, those proportions. No, you're quite right. But what I think is impressive is the fact that it's such a beautiful place and it's, I mean, I have just skimmed the surface of this building, right? And if you delve into it, every square meter, there is something that she developed. How about the connection with the landscape? Donald Hickey asks, did you look at that? The relationship with the landscape? Uh, I think it's, well. yes, I think it's somewhat rudimentary. What uh, the existing uh, terrace landscape was taken and uh, she planted uh, uh, citrus trees uh, and um, uh, laid out a tile pattern uh, on the lower level uh, and set the building at an angle to the terraces. I believe uh, she set the building at an angle so that, because she's done this kind of sun diagram that she knew uh, in the spring solstice or in the spring solstice, in the, in the spring, the sun would rise at right angles to the master bedroom. That's my That's interpretation. Okay. okay, any more questions? Can I ask a question? You have to go on mute. Yeah. Uh, Wilfried, maybe the, um, I was wondering because during the conference you mentioned a couple of times that the, the building itself is reality. And I was quite struck and I think it resonated throughout the day, maybe. Um, and then in relation to the way you do research, because I think it's quite fascinating that you rebuild this room of Eileen Gray, um, because of course that's not reality, that's a reenactment, but it appears to be reality. So I'm really curious, why don't you just, why didn't you just go to the building itself? And uh, well, there are probably very good reasons for this, but uh, the secondly, so what is this method? Uh, what, did, what did it bring you? Did, did you discover things or um, was it just as you expected or? Um... I'm, I'm very glad you asked the question because uh, the reason why this uh, master bedroom was constructed was because I was part of the scientific committee of uh, to uh, restore the, the house. And I offered uh, through the resources of my professorship to supply pieces of furniture because the original conservation architect had no clue and no interest of doing the interior. He just did the exterior and he did that very badly, it failed. There were cracks uh, a couple of years later, anyway. So I offered uh, to donate pieces of furniture, like the way that we reconstructed them, to the house. But uh, I was uh, mobbed, basically, by, by my French and uh, Austrian colleagues on the scientific committee. They said, you know, well, we know how to do it. And then I said, okay, you know how to do it. You go ahead. I will do my thing. You can do your thing. So I said, uh, I wanted to reconstruct the master bedroom. And the reason is because there are a lot of people who cannot go to see the house. So I want this thing to be available for people to visit. And the most important thing is, 
when you look at the plan where the bed lies and you look at the window, right? So the window is a, is a horizontal window, a fenêtre en longueur, as Le Corbusier pointed out, right? But importantly, it's the first fenêtre en longueur that can open completely, that doesn't have a fixed part, doesn't have a, a casement window. It's completely open, so you have a sense of panorama. None of Le Corbusier's fenêtre en longueur open completely. You go and check the designs. It was Eileen Gray and John Bardovici in this case, who developed the detailing so that it's like a concertina and it removes any glass, right? So that's very important. Also, it goes around the corner. Now, if I did a, a I did guided tour through this miniature reconstruction, at the end of the tour, I would invite one of the guests, one of the visitors to lie in the bed. Why? Because when you lie in the bed, you see the fenêtre en longueur, but you can't see the end of the right side because the, uh, the wall of the bedroom cuts off the edge. So as you lie in bed, you get the sense that the panorama is endless. And what does that do? It gives you a sense of great space. Right? What a fantastic detail. Nobody ever talks about it because nobody ever sat or lay in the bed. And if you show that on the plan, people would say, oh, boring. But when you actually can lie in the bed, or if you see somebody lying in the bed and looking out, and they say, oh, yeah, oh, that's amazing. You know, that is a moment when experience of the real, th the real thing, the real constructed thing, but analogously, the experience of the spatial phenomenon is so powerful and so memorable that it, you know, inscribes itself in, in your mind. And I think that's the important thing. I'm sure once the building is completely renovated and if people have the chance to actually lie in the things which they are not going to have, Right, that's the other thing. It's only in the reconstruction that they can lie in the bed because they can't lie in the bed in the real thing. Um, that's it's, interesting. You know, so, yeah. it's, in, it's, it's, so it's a didactic tool. I wanted this to be a didactic tool so that the quality of the design could be experienced by normal people. And then the model is maybe even more real than the real building. <laughs> Larger than life. Thank you. No, I, I mean, you've, you've got to understand I'm a complete anti Le Corbusier person, right? Uh, oh, that's I'm a fundamental detractor. And uh, so this is a welcome instance where I can show here's a person who was more brilliant, more inventive, uh, more modest in terms of her character, but more brilliant, right? And, and her work deserves to be better known. You're here. <laughs> so any more questions? Sophie, you had a third question. I don't know if it's still there, if it's still in the air. Maybe that yes. might be the closing question. Let's yes, see. yes. Um, it's an open question. Um, um, Professor Wang, your, uh, the examples that you gave us and also um, the, the books I, I um, I looked up before your lecture um, are merely on, on canon, uh, canonic buildings and canonic architects. And uh, the question is, um, everything that you learn from uh, doing this research, how would that relate to uh, the built environment in its uh, everyday um, transformation process? And how can uh, what you learn from these uh, canonic uh, studying these canonic buildings in the way uh, that you do um, help uh, practicing architects um, that cannot deal with an Eileen Gray uh, building, for example? Well, uh, it's a fair, fair question. And um, I spoke about dead white males, and that's quite true in, in my selection uh, from most of the uh, cases. Uh, my interest has changed uh, in the last few years. Uh, I, you know, I showed um, Alborde 
uh, for that reason. Uh, and uh, I have an interest in contemporary architects, young architects. Um, uh, and, you know, when they were young, I was interested in the work of uh, Herzog de Moron and colleagues. So, um, you know, I, I have been um, trying to bring forward uh, the work of the, you know, the next generations. It's becoming more and more difficult because uh, the proliferation of media has changed, right? We are in a, a digital world uh, where the importance of books is uh, rapidly diminishing. And, um, you know, there are hardly any bookshops, everything is through Amazon, etc. So, um, um, we have to rethink how we, you know, put forward certain ideas and certain work, and it's become more and more difficult. Um, so, that's all I can say. I mean, yes, um, there are some uh, uh, important directions, which I think uh, are being demonstrated by people like Rosanna Montiel, do you know her, a Mexican architect? Um, fascinating. She's doing a lot of uh, very inventive bottom-up things. Uh, she's studying uh, Mexico. There are people in, you know, I had fortune to travel in South America, so we produced a series of um, so-called duographs where we showed the work of um, Argentinian, Brazilian, um, um, uh, Mexican, uh, Chilean architects, right? Uh, some of them are quite well known now. Uh, others are still relatively unknown. But uh, so we had a number of conferences called Latitudes where we would invite four architects from the South of America or South America and four architects from North America. We had seven of those and uh, they were very uh, well attended at our school. And we, we also held them in Sao Paulo and in Chile, uh, Santiago, Chile. So, you know, we, we try to do our best. It's very difficult, it's very costly and it doesn't have all that much of an effect. That's all I can say, right? But. Uh, it's not for the lack of wanting to do it. Uh, we have done it and uh, uh, it's not been as, uh, as effective. Maybe moving away from the old white men a little bit more, we have one more question by Saar Megang, who's uh, one of the young promising architects in Flanders. Um, Sarah. Saar? Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the, the lecture. It's very interesting. Uh, what uh, interests me is um, how do you see a kind of sensitivity uh, and awareness uh, to history and context, context uh, in relation to a kind of ethnographic approach or methods in um, architecture? Very little. Unfortunately, um, I, I'm teaching a studio this semester. The title of the studio is Architecture Where It Matters. And I'm asking students to choose a site and a need that they want to redress. As part of the investigation, I have asked them to look at how primary construction systems work. So I asked them to look at how igloos are built. Do you know how igloo, how, do you know how an igloo is built? <laughs> and I, I'll just shortcut it. An igloo is built not layer by layer because the, the pieces would fall down. It's built as a helix, right? There are always two sides that support the next block. Now imagine these guys didn't have computers, they had no paper, they had no pencil. They don't have anything but a cutting tool and the snow. And you have to do it in half an hour because if you don't do it in half an hour, you're dead, you're frozen. Um, Nubian vaults, have you come across Nubian vaults? Nubian vaults are centerless vaults that have longitudinal low walls, um, high end walls, and you begin by laying a brick on the diagonal. 
and you lay elliptical hoops, right? Like this. Who came up with that idea? Now these guys at the ETH and all these other places in Stuttgart, you know, who are doing these wonderful thin, thin shelled structures. It's all a waste of time. It's all been done already, right? The Boveda, the uh, Guastavino vaults and so on. Just save taxpayers money and do something sensible, right? Go back to these primary constructions, right? How, uh, yes, ethnographic, uh, how these people did it. In Ireland or Northern Europe, the dolmen, have you come across the dolmen? You know what a dolmen is? A burial, a burial structure, three or four stones and a stone on top. Some of these stones were, weigh 200 tons. How did they get those things on top? Nobody knows, right? We think because we have technology, well, we can do anything. No, we think we can do anything, but we actually, we, we are unable to do the right thing with the right technology. We are wasting energy. We're wasting our creativity. And we are not focusing on the real needs. That, you know, that, um, there are people who lack clean water in the United States, right? Who lack schools across the world. Uh, what are we doing? We are building another museum in Abu Dhabi, uh, blah, 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 and so on. So there's enough to do. Um, there's enough money, there are enough resources, except that we have to reor reorientate those resources and those uh, are, you know, our own uh, focus. And I think you're right. We need to uh, look at those achievements, not call them primitive cultures because they've never been primitive. They were always highly sophisticated, highly intelligent in the use of resources, highly inventive. And if we begin to understand that, and if we understand how they constructed amazing structures with very few resources, we become a little bit more modest in our claims. Wilfried, can we bother you with one more question? No, sure. Also, when you know it's by Tony Fredden? <laughs> You we're mean free. you were fighting this morning almost? No, no. no I mean, the, no, no. Tony, Tony and I, friendly now. it's funny. Tony and I have a conversation. He always thinks I'm criticizing something he's saying. It's not true. No, no, that isn't what I think, Wilfred. I just disagree sometimes. But Wilfred, I, I mean, I, I'm completely in sympathy with what you're saying about learning from um, vernacular techniques. And the, but what interests me is that Eileen Gray, in almost all of her work as it developed, um, used a modernist aesthetic. And in the house that she made that you describe and care for, the huge difference between, let's say, Corbusier and other modernists was that she had a sensibility such as you described. Um, so I, um, this is interesting because you were dismissive of modernism, but for Eileen Gray, for her own house, modernism was the vehicle for um, the kind of sensitivity that you're describing. And in fact, actually, it's been <coughs> her work was part of um, um, Sandy Wilson's um, other modernist critique, where you know, he compares a house by Corbusier and Eileen Gray's house for its Eileen Gray's work is, as you describe, um, exploits, I mean, in the best sense, the, the surroundings. Whereas Corbusier was a dictatorial to his clients and, and it was full of um, propositions, which I detest and I sent you to test. But I, I'm interested in how you, you know, I, I'm interested in the fact that Eileen Gray embraced the a, a modernist um, ideology and the modernist aesthetic to do what you admire. She did for a period and then she moved on. So uh, her second house was still 
very much in the modernist vein, but uh, a third house wasn't. And uh, if you look at her subsequent designs, they change. And uh, she was quite clear, and that's why she gave her houses away. I mean, she was independently wealthy for a start, right? Um, she didn't want to, she, she was unmarried, didn't have children. She uh, didn't want to leave anything and she didn't want to bother anybody. And uh, so everything was in a way uh, an exploration of the human spirit at our moment, at the, what is possible to, what, is, what can one create at this moment? And she was not interested in modernism. In fact, modernism in the in, as a static uh, stylistic proposal. And if you look, if you read her conversation with Jean Babovici in um, uh, L'Architecture Vivante, in that special issue, she in fact says, you know, uh, from eclecticism to doubt, she's saying all this uh, modernist discussion is a formalism. She says that, right? And uh, what that means to me is that she was aware of the pitfalls that uh, this kind of standardization and the mechanization would bring. Uh, and yet she was uh, interested in that particular aesthetic for that moment. Uh, and uh, she, was, uh, she was aware of the problems. But Wilfried, there is another issue, which is that um, architects from Schinkel's time onwards became aware that the political and physical formation of cities, the introduction of different forms of transport and political constructions would, they intuited, demand another type of architecture and hence you've got neoclassicism. So there is a legitimate, um, let's say epochal uh, force in modernism. I, I think it's, I, I get more and more interested in Sandy Wilson's view, although I don't find it particularly well written, but his point is that, that within modernism, there were there was, when you escape the, the canon, there was a lot of other ways of addressing uh, the developing world. Well, frankly, Tony, I, uh, I am not particularly interested in this notion of clinging on to uh, the the tenets of modernism because I think there were many many mistakes uh, I think functional segregation um, the idea of minimal housing the way that it was developed uh, um, mechanic me you know industrial production I think all of those are absolute mistakes and the results we see all over the world so that, that's one aesthetic and constructional movement. And the reaction to that, we see in suburbia. We see the reality of those who can afford to escape from that, uh, that environment, mass housing. Uh, they create their own realities. They create their own fantasies, right? And uh, so if you, look at, if you look at a city and you look at the historical core, in most European cases, it's around 20, 25%, and the rest is suburbia. 60 to 75% is suburbia. Now that's all a dream world. And that is a political reality as well. Um, these are escapists, they drive SUVs. You know, I'm characterizing, okay, yeah. Uh, but certainly that's the case in Germany, uh, and certainly that's the case in the United States. Uh, and so, if they don't have to confront modernism because they have their Hispanic, the Spanish ranch style villa or whatever, um, then I don't think that that is proof that modernism got through to these people. Uh, I wouldn't argue that for a minute. I'm making another no, and, point. But what I'm saying is in the, in, in, in the total area that is being constructed in, the, in every part of the world, Modernism doesn't feature. It features in mass housing. It features in in uh, high-rise structures, but it doesn't feature. If if you ask people, do you want a modern house? The, 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 
diffused people would all say, yes, please. Well, I, I think that's also a question of timing because in the 60s, probably they would, but there have been examples of um, the, um, let's say, expressive use of modernism. For example, Lena Bobardi's work was some um, adamantly modernist, although she also experimented with um, ethnic, with um, vernacular construction, but she also saw, let's say, how in Sao Paulo in the museum, could there, a statement could be made of um, the new political reality and possibilities of a mass society in, um, in Brazil. So I, I'm not as dismissive but my view on modernism is far broader. And I think a lot of architects now, and I could say that I can see it in Flemish architecture and certainly in British architecture, a lot of us are um, concerned with uh, the extent of, um, of re let's say, the use of forms from the past, which seem to have relevance in, in the present. I mean, that's certainly focal in my work in buildings like the Red House, you know, where I deal with that. Um, so I don't think it's, I think it's, it's an issue for a lot of practicing architects that are working away at it quite carefully. Yeah, it, it, it might be, Tony, but I, what I'm saying is, yes, Lino Bobardi and, uh, you know, you name them, they're fantastic modern architects, uh, even contemporary ones like Angelo Bucci, um, and uh, Carla uh, Drosava and so on. They're doing amazing work. And then of course, right, you have Brazilian, lots of Brazilian architects, lots of South American architects doing these fantastic villas, wonderful for very wealthy people. And they're doing these fantastic high rise buildings, luxury apartments, modern, <clears throat> right? Fine. Okay. Yeah, there is that position. And you know, that architecture has quality. Now, what about the rest of the world, right? Um, and uh, I, I, I'm following what's happening in Britain and, uh, you know, the planning reformation uh, or reform and so on and the Grenfell Tower. I just, I just think that the problem is that if you give politicians a chance, they will always go for the lowest denominator. They will not go for the highest. So we're in a, in a neoliberal world where those who really need get short shrift and those who don't really need, you know, are able to do their thing. Well, that was my point this morning about the need for a, a persuasive and encompassing narrative, which the public would feel convinced by and um, that might give architecture a focus and it was interesting I was very interested in the piece you wrote for um, Frampton which I'll seek to read where, where is that published by the way I, I was looking online I didn't see it it's published in this uh... leaving a scene come back Wilfred oh okay Thames and Hudson um... what an architect in the life of okay it just mm -hmm. appeared uh, in September, so. All right. um, but it's, yeah, I, no, but, you know, I think, I think despair let's go doesn't help. Despair doesn't let's, help. No, no it's not despair. To... Let's go just, let's just go beyond style. Let's just think about space, material needs and something creative will come up and it will, if it's essential, if it's not, uh, over articulated, it will take whatever form it needs to take appropriate to the situation, the cultural context, its time and its uses. And well, let's just that. get over this issue. I, I, I mean, that was an interesting think, issue that was raised in an earlier piece this morning where uh, the account of Rem House, Rem Core House need for a house with no style. And one of the failures of functionalism was that it admitted all of those emotional components that uh, ordinary people needed. So in fact, style is an issue. Communicative qualities, as you pointed out, of architecture are, are 
as much a, a thing that we should be providing as, as anything else. In fact, equally. So I think we're in a very interesting moment where lots and lots of people are working on quite similar problems. Um, and I think if there were a, a discussion around this, a proper formalized discussion, then we might actually move from a, a series of individuals who want to find um, a social purpose for their work and something that um, was credible and wouldn't be like um, a modernist ethic. It would be much more flexible and could contain in one part the kinds of things you're discussing and the other part it could contain legitimate technicity um, in the face of um, global warming. So I think it's a very, very interesting moment for architecture. But what I find so difficult is that it's unformulated and individualized. And that's, I say that in the face of um, the willingness of most architects I know to work collaboratively and like each other, certainly in Flanders, you see it. So we, we have all the advantages available to us, but we don't quite bring them together. That's what I find frustrating. Oh, I mean, <laughs> this this morning people were making um, uh, putting in a word <laughs> for um, individualized, uh, subjective uh, reading of uh, buildings, right? They, um, the, the two morning sessions were uh, marked by that discussion, and I think that that's uh, an interesting. And what you're asking is that it should be formalized, and I can see that some people's uh, alarm bells are going off at that. No, I think I think there could be a series of agreements about um, appropriateness, which would still allow a lot of space. I mean, we are in an individualized society, and architects don't have truths as we once thought. They have audiences have people to whom they appeal. And so from that, from that um, atomization, one would hope that you could um, get all of the horses running in the right direction somehow. And I, it, well, I mean, you pointed it out actually that, you know, in the face of um, global catastrophe, architects can't, they have to be part of the voices that um, first of all, announce the problem, but also um, humanize the results, you know? Well, if you read, if you read my uh, text, I'm going to. Site specificity, uh, skilled labor and culture, you will see that, you know, I'm not saying there is a single style for everything. Uh, on the contrary, I'm saying, you know, you have to respond to the specific locality, of course, uh, and so on. So, and, but the most important thing in my view is also uh, that we respect labor, skilled labor, crafts. And that's not what we're doing at the moment. We are still hedging our bets on a high technology. And um, we believe that technology, you know, uh, 5.0, whatever it's called, uh, industrialization 4.0, BIM, you know, the, the importance placed on BIM, building information modeling, is just incredible. And it's so naive. Um, a BIM, BIM is a way to actually coordinate parts of building production, but I, I don't agree that it's that it's relentless. I mean, there's a lot of um, architects working on timber construction, high-rise yeah. timber construction. Great. So there's there's always countervailing forces. And in Fine, ways, but you know, if you prevented as a young practice of taking part in a competition because you can't show that in the past 10 years you've used <clears> BIM. <throat> it's uh, technology is being used to- Wilfred, architects of all ages are finding that. It, it's not, you know, okay. it's a widespread issue. But what I'm saying is uh, the, the fact that public authorities are re requiring that and they are <clears throat> unable to pay for the, up, the annual upgrades themselves let alone have a competent person in the team who can then manage the building once it's been handed over, right? This, this whole thing is a complete shambolic uh, nightmare. And it's because we believe that 
uh, uh, high technology software will be our nirvana. It's going to be our absolute uh, nadir. I think it's more about um, the craving for um, accountability, which you see in many spheres of yeah, life. But again, it's not an accountability in terms of quality. No, exactly. It's That's my point. Technology. It's, it's a right? displacement away from yeah. commitment and a respect because for intelligence. Not, yeah, people are not talking about quality. We're but, not talking about what does a what does a design stand for? Yeah. But that what, what was beyond beyond the kind of free. <laughs> but I, I, beyond, well, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. From what, what does a building stand <laughs> at the for? end? No, aren't you? How 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 yeah. does a building um, accommodate and inspire? You know. The but that's what. But of course, the politicians don't understand it because they're in a world of consumption, and that's my plea that actually architects and people in this program who are heads of architectural foundations could have a role in, um, and probably do have a role in, um, in making this um, narrative be more publicly understood, and certainly by politicians and commissioners.